Uh, my name's uh, Kristen Flaherty. I'm the executive director of the Novus Project, which I'll tell you about in a moment. And this is my co-presenter. Yes, hi, I'm Lavana Carpenter, and I am um, a Spanish teacher here at Halfway Brown, and also one of the diversity leaders in the primary school. Yeah. Yes. And Lavana uh, joined us on one of our summer programs this um, last summer. She gave us a first-hand experience from the Novus Project. Uh, so the Novus Project, we're a nonprofit educational support organization. We both collaborate with and support educators in developing programs um, to create what we call eye care citizens. So informed, compassionate, active, responsible, exemplary global citizens. Um, so our focus areas are service learning, civic engagement, and um, cultural responsiveness. And we see this real strong need when doing service learning work, especially to bring in that cultural responsiveness piece. Uh, how are we talking about power and privilege and those uh, really touchy, sensitive things that come into play? And so a lot of what our workshop today is going to look at um, what that might look like. Um, and when Nobis began, <laughs> we started with this uh, educational model, the global action model. And it's a project-based learning, service learning model. We were interested, is it possible to do international service without international travel? So can we have students have the same civic engagement benefits with um, international communities without the travel? And we tested the model at a number of different independent schools, and we had great success. And when we took the model, later into um, uh, charter schools and public schools and other independent schools where the teachers or the students weren't as prepared to handle the sensitive conversations that come with talking about human rights, we found that the results weren't nearly as successful and often would reinforce stereotypes. So we kind of put a pause and said, well, what do we need to, um, how can we better support educators in making this work? Um, so <laughs> we held a think tank. We brought in um, educators from all different um, teaching levels from uh, preschool all the way through college, academics, and community partners to think about what are the kind of core factors that are at play when we're trying to have these difficult conversations. And the out product was the Novus Big Ideas, that we call them. Um, and it's a conceptual framework, so a way of thinking. So if I'm building uh, service learning projects, community partnerships in my work, uh, these are the things that should always be on my mind when I'm developing lessons or engaging in conversation, or I find that my students get stuck in something in along the work, then this is the kind of uh, our go-to where we'll go back to it. And with the older students, kind of middle school, or probably third grade and up, we often encourage teachers to um, introduce the ideas, the actual you know, uh, definitions of these different words in the age-appropriate ways, so that they can use them as tools in thinking about, I don't understand why this is happening, I feel so helpless, what's at play here. And uh, the big ideas include <clears throat> history, power, relationships, uh, global citizenship, and cultural responsiveness. And what I'm going to do now is to go through each of those. Um, and uh, to give you a where we're going kind of picture. So listening is a piece that you'll find in so many of these different big ideas. Uh, and what we'll do is an activity, an experiential activity for us in a moment after we um, go through the big ideas, uh, where you have the opportunity to share and practice listening. Uh, but then we'll also kind of um, break it down afterwards in our uh, reflection using the big ideas as tools. And we can show um, practice how these might come into play. Uh, so history is our first big idea. Uh, Novus, our definition of history is a collection of various analysis and imaginative interpretations of the human experience that seeks to explain how society has changed over time. And I'm particularly interested in the idea of imaginative interpretations, right? That history is not one version of something, that each of us have an experience, and each of us has a different understanding of what that historical uh, experience of today is, right? Um, <laughs> and a piece of that that's really important is the collective identities that we bring to our experiences. So all of us belong to different groups, and those different groups have shared histories. And that shared history informs how we interact and engage in the world. And if we don't have an understanding of that, then we lose a lot of information of understanding and being able to listen and communicate with other people. So, for example, I, um, I am a middle class white female, and mm -hmm. I have uh, almost, I think it's 98% Irish heritage. And so I have a collective Irish and uh, an Irish Catholic heritage in particular. 
So I have this shared experience of knowing that and understanding uh, that as a lens of how I see the world. So when I interact with my office mate, who is <laughs> also a middle class white female, but who is Jewish, uh, we come at things from very different perspectives, right? And, uh, and without having that kind of framework, or even just naming that, sometimes we would um, hit conflicts and just stop. But if we were able to kind of identify the richness of her perspective and my perspective, and then seeing the uh, experience, it really elevates the, the opportunity. Okay. And of course, why history is important, uh, because we don't want to repeat some of the atrocities of the past, and that um, it's really important to understand where we come from and how we play into uh, the building of history for tomorrow. The next one that we want to talk about, so we're going to talk about power. Um, and I'm going to reference this a whole lot more than uh, Kristen did. But So I'm sure many of you have heard the terms power and privilege. Um, oftentimes, in diversity work especially, um, those are terms i found in my experience that people are you know, familiar with, maybe not necessarily um, you understand how they play out for them personally. So we're going to take a look at that. So power as a social force is the degree of impact of a person, institution, or system in relation to others' beliefs, behaviors, or values. Now, power is not necessarily only defined as power over, but it's also the capacity to act or to prevent an action. And so that basically is also sort of power with um, and then what is the other power within, right? So power within, power within, sorry about that. All right. Um, and then um, power has often been defined as something one does, not something um, that one has. Oh, yeah, we're just All right. The other aspect of power is privilege. And privilege, uh, which is basically unearned power. And privilege operates on personal, interpersonal, cultural, and institutional levels and gives preferential treatment to one individual or group while withholding it um, from another. And privilege is characteristically invisible to those um, who have it, and privileges are basically assets, unearned assets granted to dominant groups, whether they are um, desired or not. Um, and I want to share an, um, an example of how this uh, sort of played out um, in an activity I was doing with my students. We were um, in a Spanish class just, you know, looking at vocab for the house. You know, just living room, how do you say, dining room, et cetera, et cetera. And prior to doing that, I incorporated, I'm also our diversity liaison, so aside from that, um, talked about, we were talking about dwellings, like where do people dwell in general? So the girls said, oh, they, you can dwell in a vacation home. <laughs> Um, you can dwell in a house, an apartment, a condo. And so they began to name all of these places. We were just brainstorming and taking um, note. Um, you know, I was listing those. And one of my students raised her hand and said, you know, people can live in a car. And that is, I, I was not expecting anyone to say that. So in my lesson, I had planned to throw that out there. But interestingly enough, my students said that. And, you know, some of those students said, you can't live in a car. Nobody can live. Nobody lives in a car. And so we, and this was a second grade class, by the way. And so we, um, you, we basically sort of talked about that power piece using, the, you know, language that's appropriate for a, a second grader, obviously. But, you know, what, le what might lead to someone living in a car is that, do, you know, do you know of anyone that would choose from day to day to live in their car? And, um, or is that a result of sort of a power structure? And we talked about that. And we had a really, really great conversation, um, you know, about that. But it was really important for them to see sort of how power played in something that didn't even, you know, seem like it would fit. All right, so, and I'm, yep, yeah, really just got it. All right, so. First thing with the relationships, um, this is, an, again, one of our other big ideas. It's about listening first. So when trying to understand the origins and dynamics of problems facing a community, it is really important to always start with those affected by the problem. Okay, So not coming in with the expectation to solve, but rather knowing um, that, or assuming that the solution is right there in the community. Only through real reciprocal community partnerships where both parties are set to benefit can meaningful relationships be achieved and the work of sustainable empowerment begin. So, 
And this is particularly yeah, interesting mm -hmm. when thinking about developing service learning partnerships as an educator, because we don't come in with the privilege of being able to just mm -hmm. form a relationship uh, with only what I need. But we also have the concerns of I'm responsible for my students and their learning needs, et cetera. So there's a, already a power differential that has to be um, uh, worked upon in order to navigate that. And then with relationships, you're also thinking about, am I partnering with the local soup kitchen and is the board of our um, board member of uh, someone at our school also on their board there? And therefore, if they have a bad relationship with us, might they lose their funding? You know, So uh, there are a lot of, and of course, that's a power piece of that relationship, of kind of thinking about how honest can they really be with me? And then also, how long does it take to form a relationship? Right? This expectation that, I can just call someone and say, I want to bring 30 kids to you on this particular day. Does that work for you? Uh, and I do a lot of work also training nonprofits to say no. Because <laughs> um, you know, we think that volunteering is great, but the amount of hours that it might take that organization to prepare for 30 minutes of working with your students takes away from the expertise that they have in running their organization potentially. So how is it really reciprocal? And how are we building a relationship where we're listening to what their needs and giving them the opportunity to fully express their needs? Um, and that we can't expect that that's going to happen right away. That it's going to take a lot of time. And potentially it's going to uh, create conflict. And, uh, and often when we're in the uh, position of, of power and privilege that we can walk away from that, right? That we can just choose, it's easier for me to work with someone, um, the example that I use in our Savannah program that we'll tell you about in a little bit, uh, I, I partner with Sister B, who is the director of the, um, the Beach Institute, so it's a, um, a Black Heritage uh, History Museum. And Sister B comes from a very different culture than I, and she's, she's also older than I am, and she likes to tell me when I'm wrong, which makes me <laughs> not happy, right? Or uh, I get uncomfortable with that kind of experience. And, um, and she'll also call me out on things when she thinks that I'm saying something that's inappro culturally inappropriate or I've made a comment where I'm overstepping my bounds. And uh, uh, then we also work with the Davenport House, which is a wonderful house museum run by the Historical Savannah Society, run by Jamie. And Jamie is the white middle class female like myself. So working with Jamie is really easy because we have a lot of the similar understandings of how to do business and um, we come from a similar framework. So I could choose to work with Jamie, but I, or I could choose to work with Sister V and allow myself to be uncomfortable. And thinking about the benefits that I'm going to learn and the benefits that my students have to learn of me being willing to be uncomfortable and to learn um, and from that place. So that's a little piece of what relationship might look like. So global citizenship is another piece that Novus adds to the big ideas. And we break it down into these three components. One is the civic engagement, right? Um, and in all honesty, service learning is still very much the language that we use in education. However, I have um, strong reservations about the language because it really implies that we're here to serve you, that there's already uh, we're discussing like a power dynamic there. And so I much prefer language of civic engagement where we're preparing our students to be actively engaged, that they have a duty to be engaged in their community, not that they need it to have extra resume credits in order to get into college or uh, look good on job applications, but because they're actually committed to their community. So, uh, so we usually use the civic engagement language. Um, and global citizenship also looks at this idea of our shared fate and our social responsibility to be engaged. And too often in the U.S. we think of global as automatically meaning international. And it happens that the U.S. is also on the globe. We're not our own little sphere as <laughs> we refer to ourselves. So, so we include any project that you might do that is actually a local project is still also a global citizenship project. Um, and too often, uh, it's hard for us to do anything locally that doesn't actually have some interconnected piece of something that's going on internationally in terms of where supplies come from, et cetera. Um, and cultural responsiveness is the last piece here. Um, and here we're looking at uh, Listening without judgment, that's my, my short version mm -hmm. of, uh, if I was telling my students, take the note, uh, listening without judgment. So how do we listen to people's thoughts, feelings, experiences, and perspectives without judgment? How do we develop a respect for everyone? And how do we develop skills to analytically process conflicting sets of values um, and res with respect to differences in people's cultures and identities and worldviews? 
there's not, we're not always going to see eye to eye. And there's so much value in seeing a different perspective in a way that I hadn't thought of it. Um, there's a great book called Dead Aid. It's written by this uh, female economic uh, economist who, I apologize for forgetting which country she's from uh, in Africa. I think she's from Nigeria. And, um, and she makes this economic argument. And the book's all about why aid has not worked in Africa. Um, and she makes the argument that democracy might not be the answer. Well, and then the US, that would be like uh, sacrilege to even say that <laughs> democracy might not be the answer. But it, when you have a dictatorship, uh, a benevolent dictator, you can make progress really fast and democracy is really slow. So if I need a country to get infrastructure built and move forward, then maybe this way of thinking that we always hold true isn't actually the case. Um, and there's a similar resource, the Poverty Action Lab uh, does this fabulous work. This, uh, these professors out of MIT wrote another wonderful book called uh, Poor Economics. And they take ethnography with economic theory to look at uh, do these economic principles that hold in the West really apply to the global South? And one of them is, we, I'm sure your schools always say this, we have to charge something because if we don't charge something, nobody will place any value to it. Uh, and so they say, well, let's see if that's really true. And they look at mosquito nets. And so they give it to some families for free, some at a reduced cost and some full price. And then they actually go in the homes and see what people have done with the mosquito nets. And what they find is they absolutely will use them if they're free. But what was most important was that they knew why it was so invaluable. That they had the education on why mosquitoes, uh, protecting mosquitoes was going to um, protect their families. Uh, and then they would find that the neighbors would go and buy them for full price because the spreading of that information one from one family to the next carried that message over. Um, Okay, so we've done a lot of talking, very fast talking. And uh, now we need to look at how do I prepare my students to listen to community partners. And of course, we should always be thinking about this, how am I preparing myself to listen to the community partner too. And so we have a, a listening activity. And um, how many of you think of yourselves as being pretty good listeners? Okay, good practice, we'll see. Uh, I, I like to think that, uh, or I hold the assumption that uh, people from the United States are not very good listeners. <laughs> we like to hear ourselves talk with myself this week. Um, and one thing that we do when we're in conversation is that we, are, we, we hear what they're saying and we're so excited about what we're going to contribute that we stop listening to them and we've started to prepare what we're going to say next, right? Uh, this is every faculty meeting, right? <laughs> and this is why so many times in meetings things are repeated over and over and over because nobody heard it the first time because they were thinking it ourselves. So uh, we're going to do a pair share, so we'll split up into pairs. And then each person is going to have three minutes, which is a long amount of time when it really comes down to it. That's all your own. And you are the only person in your pair who gets to talk. The other person does not get to talk at all. They don't get to ask uh, follow-up questions or clarifying questions. Uh, and if you can really resist it, I'd really like to not hear any of the mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, right? <laughs> that we do. So we really try, you know, and you're just showing them that you're they're listening by um, your body language, eye contact, facing them, these, these other ways, right? It's, it will be challenging and uncomfortable. It's a great experience. Um, and then we get to switch. So after three minutes, you have the time to be the, um, the listener. Or the listener. So, all right. So, and here's what you guys are going to be talking about during those three minutes. It's going to be the story of your name, the history of your name. And you're going to reflect on social identities such as, such as gender, ethnicity, whatever, fill in the blank, whatever you, you know, want to reflect upon. Um, are there any, were, in your experience, um, were there any teacher presumptions based on your name? And we're talking first name, middle name, last name, any of them, all three, one, Two of the three, however, and if you have more than three, I assume three, so I probably should have been multiple <laughs> names. Um, were you ever discriminated against in any way because of your name? And then, um, have you experienced privilege because of your name? And then lastly, um, have you ever changed your name or wanted to change your name um, because of any of these factors? So again, you have three minutes. Um, the other person, three minutes to speak, your partner is listening for three minutes, and then when time is up, you're going to stop. 
So if everybody will find a partner, do we have Okay.
something personal that we wouldn't normally talk to on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. But discover it. Then. Yeah. Discover it. Uh -huh. nice. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Uh, it's almost impossible not to respond. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Anyone else? Want to share? Yes. And then being a speaker without having any kind of response. I mean, she would smile and nod, but it was hard to know if, like, am I really boring? Right. Very nice. All right. Is there anyone else? Yes, please. I observed that Craig is very good with maintaining eye contact, and I could do that when I was listening, but when I was the speaker, my eye contact was terrible. I was flitting all around, <laughs> and I never realized that until I was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he makes really good eye contact all the time. Nice. Thank you. Okay, yes. Yeah. I just noticed how much I was still, when I was the listener, how much I was still um, thinking, and like how many times she would say something, and, and if I if responded, that it would have taken the story into a different 
Direction. Yeah, yeah, direction. Yeah, 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 based yeah, on yeah. what just my thinking process was. Mm -hmm. So that was interesting mm -hmm. to still be thinking, but not let the conversation be guided by my thinking. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. So, it the time felt like it was longer than it than it was, but I was really grateful to have the time to listen to someone that I know quite well. We've worked together on a team. Talk about a piece of her identity that I would have not taken the time to hear about. So I was really grateful for um, having the time to stop and listen about something that we would assume we'd already know, but we don't. Thank you. Oh, yes, uh, I was just please. thinking about like how much of our, or at least my education, has been um, centered around like inquiry as, as a basis for engagement. So like if I'm engaged, I'm asking you questions, I'm asking you to clarify your thinking. Right. And, and that's a very kind of, at least I think, a Western way of engaging. And so I think my family's from the Caribbean, and I, whenever I visit them, I recognize that that doesn't happen. Like, people let you finish your sentences, and there isn't, there isn't, a, there isn't a place to, like, who can ask their question first. People get through stories in a different way. And I felt, I, I was also aware of all the times I would have interjected without the challenge. So that's <coughs> Kind of shifting, we want to continue to have a conversation about this. It, I think it's really interesting, and I had warned Lachlan, I said, okay, if they only answer questions about like what was discovered in the listening, or if they only talk about what the experience of listening was like, let's make sure we redirect them to the other side of that. Um, what I want us to do is to think about, in the stories that we heard or the stories that we shared, um, where were examples of history, of power, of relationship, of that um, interconnectedness of our global citizenship or action um, and cultural responsiveness, that listening without judgment and um, uh, and holding two conflicting ideas or values at the same time. Does anybody have one of those that might arise? Yes. Um, I think this is answering a question, I'm not sure. Um, I know in sharing my name with Alethea, I was sharing about um, my name affecting my so my uh, racial identity, mm -hmm. and it wasn't until I actually met someone with my name who looked like me that I finally felt affirmed because mm -hmm. I was going through this big racial identity thing in terms of moving to a different community. Then I only see people with my name that were white. So I was like, "What's going on?" And <laughs> so it was it was it was a big challenge. So, and which one do you think that might be? Um, I think it's power and culture. A lot of power and culture yeah. responsiveness. Absolutely. Um, Darcy had an interesting story about her last name, that it's Ellsworth Yao, and it's her husband's name and her name hyphenated, but both parties have the same hyphenated last name. Oh. Um, so that seems to fit with relationships and, and power because she didn't want to take the patriarchal route of taking the name but have different names for the children. So I that And I should have um, prefaced that it would probably be a good idea if you wanted to share something about your partner's story that you confirm that it's okay if you share it, right? Because <laughs> there's also uh, 